of salvation. We also see that Judah is warned of approaching judgment for their moral depravity, political corruption, social injustice, and spiritual idolatry. And none of those sound familiar in our present day and time. But Judah, as a nation, unheeded the warning and ends up being overthrown. But also part of his message is that with the judgment, God will preserve a remnant and provide salvation and deliverance through the coming Messiah. All right. Uh, I think the next one's pretty obvious that when it comes to where Christ is seen, uh, it's all over the place. Uh, so we're going to hit that more when we're actually going through the book, but just as an overview, there's many prophecies about his first advent. And we can eat, eat, think of those, especially around Christmas time, as well as some that will await complete fulfillment at his second advent. So we see more about his kingdom in the future. All right, Con contribution to the Bible. Isaiah is mentioned by name 21 times in the New Testament. By name. Chapter 53, which we'll look at a little bit, is quoted or alluded to at least 85 times. Isaiah is characterized by systematic presentation, brilliant imagery, broad scope, clarity, beauty, and power. Now, the, there's a really condensed outline, just to get the high level, is it's divided into three parts here. Part one and two kind of go together, and then you have part three. Or part one, in, from one to 35, is prophecies of condemnation. Then we have these four chapters that they call the historical parenthesis, and that finishes off the first 39 chapters. And then from 40 to 66, we end up with some prophecies of comfort. Okay. Now, into the book. Prophecies of Condemnation. If you want to turn to Isaiah, we'll go ahead and start with chapter 1, verse 1. Just at verse 1, we see the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he beheld in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So you see right off the bat, it identifies the author. It says he's the son of Amos, just so that you, we can distinguish him from other Isaiahs. He's mostly dealing with Judah and Jerusalem and during the, the time of these kings. And we look now at verses, let's read verses 2 through 4, where we see how Judah is ripe for judgment. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Yahweh speaks. Sons I have reared and raised up, but they have transgressed against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know, my people do not perceive. Alas, sinful nation, people heavy with iniquity, seed of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have forsaken Yahweh. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel. They have become estranged from him. So this scene is like a courtroom scene, and God is calling on heavens and earth to witness his 
his charge against you know the crimes of, of Judah at this time and points out that even dumb animals can recognize their owners better than Judah can recognize the God that they should be worshiping. If we turn over to 16, this is how they should respond. Verse verse 16, Wash yourselves, purify yourselves, Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Execute justice for the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. Pretty clear. And some of you may recognize uh, verse 18. And maybe you've even memorized that. So God... (laughs) lays it out for him. Here, here's the offer of forgiveness. He will make them white as snow, take away their sins. But there, you know, the warning is, what will happen if they refuse in verse 20? They will be eaten by the sword. And he does this little play there because in 19 he's saying, you will eat the best of the land if you do, and if you don't, you will be eaten. So we get to see some, some of the, the language, the beautiful language that he uses or the pictures to try to, to communicate his, his thoughts to them. Now, I know we're, we're going to be skipping over a lot. Uh, there's an awful lot we have to leave out. And if I'm leaving out some of your favorite verses, know that I'm leaving out some of mine too. But there are some highlights that we want to hit. So if we turn over to chapter 6, this is also probably something very familiar to a lot of you. Chapter 6, starting at verse 1, where we see the time that he's actually doing this. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, with the train of his robe, filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called out while the house of God was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. I live among of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. It's Stop there just right now. We'll pick up a little bit more. But just, I mean, that's just so so magnificent a scene. And the holy, 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 we're familiar with that. We sing it. Um, It's been suggested that perhaps the reason why there's three is to deal with the the Trinity. uh, Or it's just that God is not just holy or holy, holy, but holy, holy, holy. And when you see God in His holiness, your only re- response is to see yourself in your sin. And uh, you can see Isaiah, Isaiah's response. Uh, he says, I am ruined. That word can be translated many different ways. R.C. Sproul likes to call it, 
disintegrating, that he just feels like it's going to pieces. Another way of, of translating that word is actually silenced. And you see that would also fit with the context where he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, I live among a people of unclean lips. And so there's nothing that he can say that would be appropriate in that setting once he sees himself in light of God's holiness. Now, uh, let's go ahead and keep reading. Starting, uh, I think we left off verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not know. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now, we have this quoted by Jesus in Matthew 13. So if you want to turn over to Matthew 13 and looking at verse 14. Now this is in the context Jesus has been teaching in parables, specifically the parable of the sower. He goes through and explains the parable. And then his disciples ask him, what does this mean? And he explains it. And then in verse 14, he says, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. And with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, lest they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. In Isaiah's context, he's being told that you know, just the nation will reject him. And here Christ is saying the reason why he's speaking in parables is in order to fulfill what Isaiah had said. Uh, this passage from Isaiah is also quoted by, by Paul at the end of the book of Acts for those that have, of the Jewish nation that have rejected his message. And he says what Isaiah says, and then he was going to go to the Gentiles. Okay. Next, we have another another verse that is most likely very familiar to you all. If we look at Isaiah chapter seven, in verse fourteen. Where Isaiah in this context is uh Speaking with Ahaz, the king, regarding uh, concern about the Assyrian army that has been on the move, capturing uh, all the cities in the way between where they started and on the way to Jerusalem. And Ahaz is concerned that they're next. So the Lord uh, has been giving words to, I, to Ahaz and asks him if he wants a sign. Ahaz says, no. God says, okay, well, I'll give you one anyway. In verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. You will eat curds and honey in order that, in order that he will know to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. 
So in the context of Isaiah here in talking to Ahaz, he's saying that the sign that God will give is that there will be a, a birth of a son that will be named Emmanuel, and before he reaches a certain age, the prophecy that Isaiah is given will be fulfilled. So it's setting up a certain time based on when the child is born and when he reaches a certain age, which is probably two to three years old. Uh, because at that point, we know kids can choose evil. Yeah. And, and good. We're, but we also know where else has this, uh, this prophecy uh, been fulfilled? In, oh, come on, this is a gimme. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Now all this, or 22, now all this took place in order that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So we see an example here of a prophecy that was fulfilled near term, but also had a future fulfillment and pointed to when Christ is going to be born and how his birth come about and the significance of being born of a virgin as a sign. Now, on to chapter 9. We also have another uh, famous section that many of you will be familiar with. And I don't know about you, but when I read this, I hear a certain melody in my head. Uh, anybody else read this, hear something? What, what is that? Handel's Messiah. It just, it just pops in. I tried to read this. Um, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. And uh, just, just a little aside on Handel's Messiah. I went and found, you can actually, I found a, uh, this is a verse sheet where it lists all of the passages in the Bible that are quoted in the Messiah. And of them, the, so the words of the, in the, in the libretto, which are the, the, the words that go to Handel's Messiah, 81 Bible verses from 14 different books of the Bible, with the most coming from the book of Isaiah, 21 verses. So, Isaiah was not just important in the Bible, but it's important in a great piece of music. All right. Uh, chapter 9. Verse 6. For a child will be born to us. I'm not going to sing it, by the way. And a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. So how much of that has been fulfilled About the first, first line, right? Yep. A child is born, a son is given. 
That's as, that's as far as we've gotten so far in that. And we see that there's a lot more to come. And a lot of this is either figuring the, the millennial kingdom or even on into the eternal kingdom. So that uh, a lot of that, if we read through Revelation 19 and 20, we'll see how that will be fulfilled. But yet we still sing it at Christmas time because we have the child born and the son given to us. Now, speaking of the kingdom to come, the millennial kingdom especially, if we turn over to chapter 11, we're cruising through the book here, chapter 11, verse 6. Another passage that is probably very familiar to a lot of you. Although you may have heard it in a little different way. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the younger with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a young boy will lead them also the cow and the bear will graze their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and the nursing baby will play by the hole of the cobra the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den they will, do no, they will do no evil, nor act corruptly in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Uh, definitely describing a time to come when essentially the curse will be reversed for a time and things will be back to way they were in the Garden of Eden. Now, we're going to fast forward quite a bit. Uh, we're going to be moving past a lot of the sections that deal with um, judgment for Babylon, Moab, Philistia, Damascus, Ethiopia, Egypt, There were a lot of people not behaving well at that time. Uh, skipping the Valley of Vision, Tyre. Uh, okay, we're we getting to 35. Now here we have um, another section that is quoted in the New Testament. Starting in verse 5, it says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy, for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. Does anybody recall where that is quoted by Jesus or, or paraphrased by Jesus? Exactly. John the Baptist's disciples come to Jesus. Oh, well, yeah, in, cha in chapter 11, I put that in the notes, I think. In chapter 11. Uh, John, John is in prison, and he's tracking with the ministry of Jesus, and, and he's kind of wondering, you know, how is this tying in with what John knows of Isaiah and Isaiah's prophecy of what the Messiah will, will do as far as bringing in the kingdom? And in, John doesn't, he's not doubting that Jesus is the Messiah, but did he get the message wrong as far as what was the Messiah going to be doing at this time? And so he sends his disciples to Jesus and wants to know 
Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So you can see that's very... It's kind of like a paraphrase. It's not an exact quote, but it's, he's pulling from that section in the book of Isaiah. And this is also in the Messiah, just so you know. Now, that kind of brings us to what we are calling the historical parenthesis. These four chapters we have they, they close out the, the section of the first 39 chapters and it's if you read it if you've been reading through the Bible and you read through 2 Kings and then you get to this you go I, I thought I just read this and you, you did, because uh, these four, four chapters are, are nearly identical to what is in Second Kings. And the, the theory behind that is when the author of Second Kings was compiling, he probably took these four chapters that Isaiah had written and used them or parts of them in his uh, record of the kings, because it's dealing with a specific king in here. It's, it's King Hezekiah. Um, Hezekiah gets ill. He seeks Isaiah's help. Uh, he's also dealing with uh, the Assyrians and he, he recovers. God gives him 15 more years. Then he does something foolish. Uh, uh, ambassador, you may call it, because it come from Babylon. And Hezekiah says, ooh, let me show you my stuff. In the idea that maybe he can let him know that, okay, I've got stuff to pay for you if you want to help me defeat the Assyrians. But we have a section just want to point out, this is a little bit on our angiology, uh, theology here. In chapter 37, verse 36, which is identical to 2 Kings 19.35, where the, arm, uh, the army of Assyria is out there, and the next day, didn't go well for him. Because the angel of, of Yahweh went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And the men arose early in the morning, and behold, all of them were dead bodies. I mean, that's just an unbelievable number uh, of troops. And uh, kind of gives you uh, a hint of the power that an angel has over our weak human flesh. That one angel in one night could just take out 185,000. That uh, wraps up the first 39 verses. That was fast. Twenty-seven to go. Starting in chapter 40, verse 1, we see a, a change of direction. Isaiah is now going to be giving a message of comfort and hope. Starts off, comfort, oh comfort my people. Which of course is also from the Messiah. Speak to the heart of Jerusalem and call out to her and her warfare, 
Call out to her that her warfare has been fulfilled, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received from the hand of Yahweh double for all her sins. And then the next verse is also familiar, I think, to people. A voice is calling, prepare the way for Yahweh in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. In verse 3, we can compare that to Matthew 3, 3. Because who is that applied to? John the Baptist. Yes. In Matthew chapter 3, Now in those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So here we see where Isaiah starts this section of the last 27 books with where Matthew starts off with in the start of the New Testament, that the Messiah is coming, and the forerunner is here announcing that. Another thing to keep in mind here in this section of is that Isaiah is, is also telling this to the people, but he's shifting to about 100 years in the future because he's telling them a message and it's geared towards those who are captive in Babylon. And that's not going to take place until 586, and he's back in 690s, 680s. So, so we have him preaching a message of comfort that the people that are captive will be returned. And you can see at the end of chapter 2, God says that... Um, You've paid double for your sins, and that's referring to their captivity in Babylon. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read. You see, we left, it, left off at verse 3. There's some more I want to read there. Starting at verse 4, back in Isaiah chapter 40. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of Yahweh will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. A voice says, Call out. Then he answered, What shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and all its loving kindness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of Yahweh blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And see, we see here just a glimpse of the importance of God's word and, and his eternality around that. That no matter, you know, everything here is temporal. But God's word is not. Now, if we move on a little farther to chapter 52, we have another section here that is quoted in the New Testament. Verse 7 reads, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who proclaims good news, who announces peace and proclaims good news of good things, who announces salvation and says to Zion, Your God reigns. And Paul, 
in Romans 10. Verse 15 quotes this when he's talking about um, preaching the gospel. He says, How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. Then he goes on. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And you can see Paul was also very familiar with the book of Isaiah and applies that section to those who share the good news of the gospel. Of Christ. Next, we get into the start of what I'm, I've heard it called the fifth gospel. It starts in chapter 52, verse 13 and runs all the way through the end of 53. We look at 13 through 15. In chapter 52, section on the exalted servant. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see, and what they had not heard, they will understand. I was uh, checking John MacArthur's notes in the study Bible, and... uh, read a quote because it really sums up this section very well. It says, This section contains unarguable, incontrovertible proof that God is the author of Scripture and Jesus is the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy. The details are so minute that no human could have predicted them by accident and no imposter fulfilled them by cunning. And uh, there's actually... uh, John MacArthur's written a whole book on this section here called the, the Gospel According to God to go along with this series of the Gospel According to Jesus and the Gospel According to Paul. So if we turn to now to 53 and just look at verse 1, that will be familiar because we just read that by Paul in Romans 16 where he says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? We've got this good news, but not all that hear it will believe it. And then we have chapter 53, which of course is a whole series of messages just in itself. But what we see here for the notes is the suffering servant who will be the atoning sacrifice. And as a preview, in this section we will see the work of Christ in his substitutionary death, his burial, his resurrection, his saving of sinners, his intercession, and his kingdom. Uh, So, verse 2. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and forsaken of men, 
a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our peace fell on him, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, that for the transgression transgression of my people, striking was due to him. So his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with the rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If you would place his soul as a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will exceed will succeed in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide for him a portion with the many, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. Uh, yeah, lot there, um, and as we read, you know, it, it would be pretty much impossible for this to have just um, been written at this time, and then not fulfilled the way it was, without God, you know, having his his omniscience to know. And to tell Isaiah, okay, write this, write it this way, because this is what will happen. And one of the things that we do see is how the servant will be the atoning sacrifice, that it's uh, the substitution, and we give him our unrighteousness and our sin. He pays the price for it. He gives us his righteousness so that then we can be righteous before God because nothing that we do will be good enough but what Christ did was perfect. And so that's just just a beautiful picture of the gospel in that section. Now, we're getting close. Isaiah 61. We look at verses 1 and 2. It says, the Spirit, the Spirit of Lord Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh has appointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now, this shows up in Luke chapter 4, not as a quote from Isaiah that Jesus speaks, but Jesus is in Nazareth, and he's in the synagogue on the Sabbath, where it was tradition for a teacher, visiting teacher, could be given a text to read. And they go in in a certain order, and so 
at that time, this was the passage that was due. And so the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus. He opened it, found the place where it is written, and it, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So he pulls it directly from Isaiah and applies it to himself. But he didn't read the whole passage. He stopped. Why did Jesus stop reading where he did? Because it wasn't being fulfilled at that time. Because he's, yes. In Isaiah, we have this another example of the certain part will be fulfilled up to a point out of one time, and then more will be fulfilled later on. Because at the time that Isaiah was writing, and the visions that he had, the instructions that he had, that God gave him, it wasn't clear the time. Of, of when all this would take place and would it all be the same event or would it be broken up? And we, we see that as we read through Isaiah and as we have more revelation at the time of Christ, you know, we see the things that were fulfilled by Christ during his lifetime and then we see here that there's more to come. And I, Isaiah wasn't clear to him. I mean, God didn't point out the time frame that said, okay, up up to here, this will, be, this will be fulfilled in this time, and then this section here applies here. Uh, but looking at the whole of Scripture, comparing it to Revelation and the like, we, we can do that and see where these are. Now the rest, Isaiah wraps up with predictions of Jerusalem being rebuilt, Israel's borders being enlarged, the Messiah reigning over his rightful kingdom. God's enemies will be judged. And then we get to where there will be peace, prosperity, and justice, and God will make all things new. And all God's people said, Amen. Yeah. Um, that's a, a brief overview of the book of Isaiah. Uh, Anybody have any thing to add with no time left? Good. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. How that? How that fits? And it helps you, you know, as you as you. Now know about Isaiah, you can go, oh, okay, it, it, it has 66 chapters. Now you know. I mean, if somebody comes up and says, hey, do you know how many chapters are in Isaiah? And you go, oh, yeah, I do, in fact. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and close because people are waiting to get into church here. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this study. I pray that it was helpful and that uh, helps us know you are sovereign. You are high and lifted up. You are holy, holy, holy. And you have a plan, that you have a future, and that we can glory in that. Because in the end, we win, and there's just a glorious time to come. We want to pray for the, the rest of the service, and just that it would be a very profitable time for all of us here. In your name we pray. Amen.